Well, what's happening at Transformation Church? Let's give a huge welcome to all of our first-time guests who are watching online and who are physically here. Thank you so much for being here. Let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facilities partnerships. We believe in you. And to the TC family, it is so, so good to see um, everybody. Whether if you are a member of Transformation Church, whether if you're visiting Transformation Church as our guest, um, whether you're at a place of like, I don't even know why I'm here. Um, I've got some really, really good news. Uh, there's nobody perfect that's a part of Transformation Church, but there is a perfect Savior that we can point you to, and he is gracious, and he is kind, and he is good, he is forgiving, he's healing, and also, now don't miss this, he will jack you up. He'll get all up in your grill. And what do I mean by that is this. He wants to stretch the fabric of your soul to become and do things you and I never, ever thought was possible. Why? Because he's the God of him possible. Christmas is a story of the impossibility because the world was an absolute mess, but the dark powers discounted the one who is him possible, and him himself came, and in case you don't know who I'm talking about, his name is Jesus. And as we look at what does it mean for him to be great, and earth we receive her king. Often what we do, now teenagers dig into this, young adults dig into this, matter of fact, all of us dig into this, what we typically do is we over-commercialize what Christmas is. I've been saying this for 13 years, I'll say it for 30 more years. The most important part of Christmas is not gifts under a tree, but God's gift that hung on that tree called the cross. Because in the cross is forgiveness. In the cross is love. In the cross is the purpose that you and I were created for. But also, when Jesus was born, now part of my job as pastor is I have to be a historian. We got to be careful. Jesus is not a 2023 figure born in America. He is a first century, second temple Jewish man born into a particular context. And we want to go back to his world so that we can enter his world called the kingdom of God. What was it like when, when Jesus was born? It wasn't much different than we have today. I'm 52 years old. Born in 1971, Vietnam War was still going in the 80s. I remember stuff in the Caribbean uh, with, 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 with war, and I remember Desert Storm and War on Terrorism, 9-11, and what we have now. So, so, so war is nothing new to humanity. Vicky and I were in Greece not too long ago, and as we studied about Greece, it was long history of just people having wars. Matter of fact, I said to the tour guide, so basically, studying Greek history is a history of war. Well, we're really, really good at creating chaos and brokenness. And and Jesus is the light that comes into the world because he actually wants to heal it, but the way he heals it is through you and I. We're going to cover that a little bit more. But when Jesus came into the world, Christmas season did not look like a Target commercial. It looked like a world of chaos, retribution, occupation, and sin, sickness. So so let's start with the O first. So the Jewish people are in the promised land, but they're being dominated by a pagan Gentile power called Rome. The Jewish people could not do anything without Rome's permission. And so Jesus grew up in an occupied country under the domination of a pagan empire. Why is that important? Because the Jewish people said, hey, if we're God's chosen people, why are these Gentiles dominating us, making our land impure? Why is this happening? And so the First Testament, which is the Old Testament, the First Testament tells a story that God himself would come to earth and be king. And the Jewish people were longing for this Messiah to come. But they, many of them were longing for him to kick the Romans out, not save the Romans. All right, let's get up in our grills really, really quick here. The people that you and I don't like, Jesus died for. The people that you and I have vengeance against, Jesus died for. Jesus loves the people that you and I don't like. Jesus loves the people that hurt us. 
Jesus loves the people who betrayed us. So oftentimes we want a Jesus to give out retribution, but not a Jesus to give grace. And so Jesus shows up not just to kick the Romans out, but to kick the Romans into his kingdom. So Jesus was born in occupation. He was born in a time of complete chaos, a time of retribution. So there's these wise men from the east, as the book of Matthew says, and they see a star, and it's sending them to Jesus, the Messiah, King Herod. On the count of three, everybody say Herod with me. One, two, three, Herod. Who is King Herod? King Herod was the king of the Jews. Who was King Herod? He was an idiomite. You're like, why does that matter? Because you have a Gentile ruling the Jews. It was very much racial. They did not want a Gentile ruling them, but they couldn't do nothing. You know why? Because of the Roman occupation. They said, we're going to put King Herod in place, and you can't do nothing about it. So what did King Herod do for the religious establishment? He said, you know what? I'm going to build you guys a temple. So whenever you hear me say first century, second temple, we're talking about the temple that King Herod built. So King Herod built the temple to keep the religious establishment okay, but he was a paranoid psychopath. He finds out, hey, a wise man, so you say a baby's going to be born. Well, King Herod was smart enough to know that the book of Micah says that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. What's the problem? King Herod's like, no, no, ain't no baby boy going to be the king. I'm going to be the king. He was using power. So what does he do? He tells the wise men, yo, wise men, when you find a baby, let me know. I want to worship him too. You do know that people still use religion to do evil things, right? Let me pause here. You may be watching, you may be here, and you're like, yeah, that's the truest thing you said. These, these Christians are just mean. My question is, did you really engage a Christian, though? Because just because someone says they're a Christian doesn't mean they're a Christian. I could go in a garage, that'll make me a BMW. <laughs> so if you're going to judge a faith, judge it by Jesus, because he's the best example of that faith. And by the way, Jesus isn't going to go on judgment day. Why didn't you trust me? Well, it's because Derwin made me mad. Well, Derwin don't have holes in his wrist, in his side, a crown on his head. I do. The wise men find Jesus, frankincense and myrrh, but they have discernment. Don't tell that paranoid Herod because he's going to kill him. So they leave, Herod founds out he's been duped. So what does Herod do according to Matthew 2? He goes on retribution and he, listen now, in Bethlehem, he kills every baby boy two years and younger. Welcome to Christmas. It was a time of chaos, retribution, occupation, and sin, sickness. Let's pause here. The word sin literally means to miss the mark. It, it's a, it was a common verbiage in the ancient antiquity of an archer shooting an arrow at a target, and if you miss, you say sin. Well, God has a target for humanity, and it was completely to love him and to love your neighbors, you love yourself. If that happened, heaven would invade earth. Well, sin is actually you and I telling God, hey, God, you, you know what? Um, I'm going to choose anger because I want to build my kingdom. Hey, God, I'm going I'm to choose lying instead of truth. I'm going to build my, I'm going to choose greed. I'm going to choose sexual morality. I'm going to, I'm going to choose selfishness over your kingdom. Guys, it is so much more than doing just a little boo-boo. It is actually us going, God, I don't want to rule and reign with you. God is literally, Christmas is an invitation to God saying, take your seat and rule with me. And you know what we do? We play in mud puddles instead of going to his grand banquet of grace. But in the midst of chaos, and I hope you know I made the cross. In the midst of the chaos, the retribution, the occupation, the sin, sickness, beauty was on his way. And he came with light and love to offer restoration for anybody who would receive it. Christians over the last several hundred years have observed what's called Advent, this season of year. And when Jesus was born on the date doesn't really matter. 
Because if you go to TikTok, you know, Jesus wasn't born in December because the shepherds were outside. It would have been too cold. It doesn't matter when he was born. What matters is he was born. That's what ma matters, is that he was born and he did what he said that he was going to do. So Advent is a special time of year leading up to Christmas. Christmas, more Christ. Christmas, more Christ. It's a season of us thinking and longing for him when we marinate on the longing of God's people for the Messiah. Really quickly here. The word Messiah, Hamashiach in Hebrew, means the anointed king. The First Testament, the Old Testament, tells about that God would come himself to save the world. The word Christ, Christos, is the Greek equivalent to Messiah. So Jesus' name on his birth certificate was not Jesus Christ. Christ and Messiah is a divine title. So a longing which was fulfilled in the arrival of King Jesus. So what we're doing is we focus and move towards Christmas is we're increasing our longings for him. Um, that's why traditionally there are lights and candles that are lit to show that light had come into the world. Now here's what I want you to grab, and I'm gonna explore it more. Teenagers, young adults, everybody. Jesus comes as the light of the world to invite us into the light so that you and I can now light up the darkness. Have you ever met someone who all they do is point out the problems and never have a solution? Man, this is bad. This is this. This is this. We need to change this. We need, and then they never offer a solution. Well, oftentimes, and hear my heart, many times as Christians, that's what we do. And God is going, bro, you are the solution. That's why I saved you, to be light in the darkness. So I want you to know right now, if you follow Jesus, if you don't, hold on. But if you follow Jesus, I'm putting you on notice right now. You are the solution to the problem because Jesus, who is full of grace and mercy, puts his life in you to be the solution to the problem. Okay, yeah, we can clap about that. That's good, that's good. Okay, this is a flashlight. If you're under 30, newsflash, when you get in your 50s, something traumatic is gonna happen. You're gonna wake up every day in the middle of the night to pee. Can I get an amen? And it disturbs your sleep. <laughs> and so I'm fumbling around, I'm running over stuff, and Lord have mercy, I don't want to wake up Vicki Gray. That would be a significant problem. <laughs> so it's double jeopardy in the house. I can't turn on the lights, I'm bumping everywhere, can't wake her up. It would be nice to have a little flashlight, right? But the thing is, what if my flashlight didn't have batteries? It wouldn't do any good. Let's have a moment of transparency. Do, do, do you feel like you're just bumping around and you can't really see and you're bumping into people and you're bumping into other things, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and you're like, I just can't see. And what happens is you get used to being in the dark. There's these fish in caves in Kentucky that they've been in the dark so long they no longer have eyes. Well, a flashlight is no good if it doesn't have a battery. Well, human beings, you and I are like this flashlight, and Jesus is the battery or eternal life so that we can actually shine and actually see, but don't miss this, don't miss this. When you shine, you help other people see. Our series is called Greatness, Let Earth Receive her king, young adults, check this out. Why is Jesus great? Why is he great? Let's start here. He rescued us from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom of light. He is a rescuer. Where do we get this from? I'm glad you asked. The Bible. We love the Bible. We're going to spend time in Colossians chapter 1, 13 uh, through 20 for the next several weeks of Advent. This is some of the greatest writing that has ever been written about Jesus. And the Apostle Paul is writing to churches in Colossae, people from everywhere, multicolored like this, multi generations generations, people from different backgrounds, different sin issues, all types of things. And he's like, you know what brings us together? Jesus. Let me tell you about who he is and what he's done. He starts this way. 
He says, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. This word rescued, sozo, is very urgent. Like, like he's rescued us from the king of darkness. Like we are in danger. There used to be a rapper that goes, danger. So we are in danger. <laughs> but we don't realize we're in danger. Now follow me here, follow me here. We're going to land this little illustration, but follow me. The problem with humanity is not poverty. The problem with humanity is not greed. The problem with humanity is not war. The problem with humanity is not the fruit of the symptoms of the real problem. The real problem is the Bible says we are in the kingdom of darkness, that even our good stuff is bad stuff because it doesn't glorify God. It glorifies us. We are trapped. My whole life, football is a beating ground for self-help. Do your best, do this, overcome this. And I followed it in my third year in the NFL. I go, I can't help myself. The new clothes don't fix up the raggedy man on the inside. The people cheering for me still does not fill the void of a dad not going to my games. I need forgiveness. And the more good stuff I do, it's like taking a bath only to see that I'm dirty. Our problem is we're in darkness, friends. Now, let me pause here. God does not send anyone to eternal death and damnation known as hell. We send ourselves. Please understand that. God doesn't go, I'm gonna send you there. He's, he's like, no, no, come in. Please come in. Why would someone who spent their earthly life trying to get away from Jesus want to spend eternity with someone they've tried to get away from? At the end of the day, there's two types of people in the world. My will be done or thy will be done. Thy will is so much better than my will. The kingdom of darkness with dark powers. But what did God do? He's so gracious. He transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son transferred. Growing up in San Antonio as a little boy, eight, nine, 10 years old, I get on the bus on the west side and I could go downtown with my, uh, you, you, you pay to get on, the bus driver gives you a piece of paper called a transfer, you get downtown, go to the next stop, give the new bus your transfer purpose, go to the east side. That's what God did for us. Except for he didn't give us papers, he gave us a cross. We didn't have to pay, he actually paid. He wants to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Now listen to me, okay? This is gonna sound a little bit abrupt, but I need you to follow me here. This is gonna sound abrupt, but follow me here. This is the most gracious thing I can say. When Jesus brought you into his kingdom, he does not give a rip about me or your dreams. He goes, they're way too small. <laughs> you just wanna be a businessman and have a big old house. Man, you missing it. Ain't nothing wrong with a big house, but you can have a big house and it'd be empty. You can have a nice car and drive you everywhere, but your soul will be lost. He's, he's going, no, no, I got something better. I want to fill you with my hopes and my dreams and my desires, and, and I'm going to give you gifts you never, ever thought you could have. I say this all the time because I'm enchanted by it. I'm overwhelmed by it. Teenagers, if you would have told me at 17 that a compulsive stutterer who didn't own a Bible would be preaching and teaching and writing about the King Almighty, I would have said, you're crazy. I don't know who Jesus is, but he knew who I was, and he was on his way to rescue me, to rescue you. He's a a rescuer. He's a deliverer. He wants to do more than you just escape hell. He wants to bring heaven to earth through you. And you're going, Durham, but I'm not you. Good, because if you were, you wouldn't exist. You were you. God ain't surprised by you. He didn't go, oh my, didn't see that coming. <laughs> God is the only being never surprised. He has a unique beauty he wants to do in you. Let's continue with the text. Verse 14, he purchased our freedom. In the Greek language, this is the word redemption. It's rooted in ancient history, going all the way back to the Exodus. The Jewish people were in slavery in Egypt, and God redeemed them. It's a term used to set slaves free. Think about this. You and I, if we're honest, we're in slavery to first and foremost, death. Have you ever known anybody who did not die? Like my mentor used to say, we're all in the checkout line. We just don't know what number we are. 
We're all prisoners to this thing called death. If you don't believe me, that's why we age. Every day we get older is a sign we're going to die. <laughs> we're in slavery to this thing called sin. All of us have rebelled, and if we're honest, it may even be going on now. We're in slavery to this broken world. But God redeemed us. How did he do it? With his very life. Will you listen to, to me? All of us, me too, we're on a quest to be loved and to be valued and to be celebrated. The problem is, no one can actually do that for us. The job you have in the promotions is because of your performance, but you'll get fired. The people we love in our lives one day will die. And we build our value and our worth on what we do. And so we form this thing called self-esteem. And the problem with self-esteem, it's built on what you do or didn't do. It's also built on what somebody's done to you to hurt you. And Jesus is going, hey, you wanna know how valuable you are? I actually gave what is most valuable for you. How much are you worth to God? Everybody else who values you, for the most part, particularly professionally, it's because of what you produce. The football fans didn't love me. They loved me when I helped them win their little bets. They loved me when their little team won. But the minute my back and my knee went out, they didn't love me. Your job don't love you. You are a means to producing something. There's only one who said, you can't do nothing for me, but I'm gonna do everything for you. Your value and my value is found in the blood of Jesus. If not, you're gonna spend your whole life, hear my heart, you're gonna spend your whole life like that U2 song. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. For some of you in your 50s and 60s, you, you ain't got much time left. <laughs> That's me, I'm 52. <laughs> the last thing I wanna do is try to find my worth in what I do or what's been done to me. I wanna find my worth in the one who purchased me. Yeah. And what did he do? He purchased me and forgave my sins and your sins. He not only gives us worth, but then he forgives us. Here's the, here, here's, here's the thing. When you and I don't allow the forgiving grace of God to touch us deeply, the twin brothers of destruction destroy our lives, guilt and shame. Guilt says this, yeah, you did it. Shame is even worse. It goes, you are what you did. So for many of us, we are living in past brokenness and are shattered pieces in the present. And guilt and shame continues to recycle itself. For those of you who are Christians, for those of us who are Christians, guilt and shame is a mechanism to keep us from flourishing in Christ. And for those of you outside of Christ, the dark powers will use guilt and shame to tell you God could never forgive you if they knew what you did. If they knew what you did, they wouldn't even let you into this church. Listen, I got good news. There's a whole bunch of us all of us who shouldn't be in here. The only person who's qualified to be in Jesus' church is Jesus himself. And because he's gracious, he qualifies us with his grace. Hold on a second, hold on a second. I ain't got much time, so let's let it rip. I got some good news for you. Christmas is about this. It is about a God who says, I don't only value you, but your pain and your shame and your guilt, I take it upon myself. I bleed 
bleed on it. I bleed on it. I remove it. I wipe it away. And when we try to remember it and bring it to him, he says, I don't know what you're talking about. It is nailed to the cross. It is nailed to the cross. So when guilt and when shame come at you, you tell it to go to hell. Because that's what hell speaks. Hell speaks condemnation. But Jesus says this in Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Really quickly, really quick. This is, this is quick. If you've talked to anybody in recovery, one of the ways that they got out of recovery was they stopped feeling sorry for themselves. If you want to stay addicted, continue to feel sorry for yourself. Because the way you feel about yourself is the way you treat yourself. Terrible things have happened to many of us, if not all of us. But Jesus did something so much better that overshadows it. You are not what happened to you. You are what Christ has done for you. Okay, we got one verse in. Jesus is great because he shows us what Yahweh looks like. The name of God from Exodus 3, 14 and 15 is Yahweh, and the best thing you can do in the language is use what's called the tetra uh, gramnation, which just simply means the vowels. And Yahweh, God's name means a self-existent eternal one who keeps his covenant promises to his people. It means he's eternally faithful to do what he said he's going to do. And what does he say he's going to do? Rescue people, bring them into the kingdom, and one day make all things new. He's faithful. So God shows us what he's actually like. Colossians 1, 15 and 16 Christ, you know, the Messiah, is the visible image of the invisible God. We would have no clue what God looks like unless Jesus came. How gracious is it for Jesus to come and say, let me show you what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is like. Let me show you what God is like. Now, how in the world can we know what Jesus looks like if he rose again and ascended back to heaven 2,000 years ago? Newsflash, there's these books called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are more exciting than endlessly scrolling on TikTok, endlessly scrolling on Facebook, endlessly scrolling. What are you watching that's new? We're endlessly scrolling, and God is going, you could be spending time with me. And all we're doing is scrolling and creating anxiety. All we're, young ladies, listen to me. Research shows. I do social media. I'm not against it. But if you're not careful, all you're going to do is compare yourself all day long. Research shows, particularly with young ladies and mental health issues, with the iPhone advent in 2010 and social media, your anxiety, your depression, suicide has skyrocketed. So why continue to drown yourself in it? Spend time in the Word. Talk about the Word. Spend time with Jesus. Listen, those companies don't care about you. You're just advertising dollars. They're not going to be at your funeral. They're not going to be at your psych ward. You're advertising dollars. Have you noticed that the more you post, the more followers you, you, you get? It's called a dopamine hit. Ooh, let me post more so more people can follow me. I'm not saying you shouldn't get out a message, but what I am saying is don't let the mechanism destroy your soul. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything and cr was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. So Jesus in his humanity, that's called the incarnation, is 100% man. But in his divinity, he shares Godhood with the Father and Spirit. So think of a triangle. One triangle has three points. Our God has three persons. Let's look at the next part of verse. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. So that's the demonic world and the angelic world. People go, where's heaven? It's all around us. It's another dimension. All around us, there is spiritual warfare going on, family. 
It is going on. Where do you think some of those thoughts come from? You're like, what in the world was that? Whenever you hear you and it attacks you, that is the voice of an outside dark presence. Everything was created through him. Now watch this, for him. American Christians, and I include myself, Jesus did not redeem you and I to fulfill our purposes. He redeemed us and gifted us to fulfill his purposes at our jobs, in our parenting, in our athletics, in our dancing, in whatever it is that we do, law school. All of life is worship. Let me put it this way. All of life is Jesus' playground to spread joy through you and me. He created everything. So what is he like? What is he like? Jesus tells us. Jesus shows us that Yahweh is humble. I love this aspect of God, and we don't think about it a whole bunch, but Jesus helps us. So Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11, the apostle Paul is pastoring this church as like an overseer from far away, and he's hearing how these Jewish people and Gentile people are not getting along. By the way, keep this in mind, all of Paul's letters were written because the churches were not getting it right. So please don't go, man, I wanna go back to the early church. I don't. Them peoples was crazy. I do not wanna pastor them. You guys are way more better than them, I promise you. These people were off the chain. So anyway, they're arguing about stuff. Now keep in mind, imagine in a multi-ethnic Greco-Roman church, you have people who are Romans going, man, the Roman government is dope. And then you got Jewish people going, wait, 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 what? You guys are occupying my people. What do you mean they're great? Well, it's great for you because you got benefits. Can you imagine how they had to work those things out? Here's how. Paul says this, you have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. What this means is when you receive Christ, the spirit of God is in you, and through faith, we can think the way he thought, meaning scripture. Verse six, though he was theos, God, he did not think of equality with God as something to be clinged to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Let's pause here. In the incarnation, right, that means put on flesh, when Jesus came to earth, family, he was 100% human. The way he walked and defeated sin and accomplished his message was by depending on the Holy Spirit. He's our savior, he is our example, and he's the one who wants to live through us. Let me give you an illustration. Do you not think that Jesus got hit on by women? Think about it. Girl, you heard about Mary's son. He ain't never even sinned. He'd go to the synagogue and read the scriptures. He's a carpenter. He'd be working with his hands, glistening all in the sun. You don't think women hit on Jesus. You don't think Jesus had to fight off temptation. Good Jewish boy. Hebrews 4.15 says this. We have a high priest who can sympathize with everything we went through, yet he is without sin. What kind of savior would it be if he went... I don't know what it's like to fight off temptation. He does. Remember in Matthew 4, when the devil tried to tempt him? You do know Mary cleaned Jesus' diaper, right? You do know Mary, uh, you, you do know Jesus used the bathroom, right? He's 100% human being here on planet Earth. He not only shows us the Savior, but he shows us what humanity can be conformed to the image to. And what did he do? He took the humble position of a Dula, slave, servant. Read the Bible in the first century. In the Roman world, 50 to 85% of the population were what's called slaves or indentured servants. It's not the same as American race-based slavery and other parts of slavery during the Enlightenment. This is about being an indentured servant. So I did a message on that a few summers ago. You can check that out if you want to. But the, but the point is this. Jesus humbled himself and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself, there it is again, in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. 
God's grace makes no sense if we don't understand why we need grace. In our culture, a lot of times there's like, well, why would God be so judgmental? Question, let's be honest. If you've worked really hard for something and somebody broke in your house, hurt your children, and stole everything, would you go, I forgive you? Years ago, I was in Atlanta preaching. Our, our dressing room was a bathroom. Security guards were, were there. Went on stage for five minutes to preach. Came back, security cards gone, computer gone, backpack gone, wallet gone, car keys gone. I ran out of that dressing room looking for somebody. <laughs> I wanted justice. Question, how come we can ask for justice but God can't? I mean, particularly in this day and age, we want justice, but now God wouldn't do that. God is holy. He wouldn't be loving if he allowed sin to run rampant. Friends, it should have been you and I on the cross because we were the criminals, but the innocent one took upon our guilt so that we could be innocent. He took our case, he took our charge. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name that above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is curios. This is the Greek translation for Yahweh, curios that Jesus is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Here's a question. Does humility mark your life and my life? One of the ways that you know you're humble is people tell you you're humble. You don't tell people you're humble. I'm humble. <laughs> you're not. But humility is like refusing to get vengeance. Think about our world today. We cancel each other. We argue about masks on Facebook. You know, it's like, you hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you back. Where is that in Christianity? Jesus said, bless those who persecute you and love your enemies. It takes humility to sometime get walked over. But it's better to be walked over loving than to have a proud heart. Jesus knows all about that. What type of people are gonna be in the new heavens and new earth? What are they gonna look like? Here you go, Jesus tells us. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. For those of you new to Transformation Church, Eternal life is gonna be here on earth. God is gonna give us new resurrection bodies. Our, spirits, our, our, our bodies will come out of the grave. They'll become new. They'll join our spirits. We will be right here on planet earth, and these types of people will be humble. So the humble today are those who will be in a new heavens and new earth. How are we doing with humility? And humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. Humility is not being run over. Humility is being knowing how to present yourself in such a way that God is glorified. I tell you what, if we want to reach this culture that doesn't know Christ, humility is going to be the way. Because most people already know they're jacked up. That's why they're so angry. What would happen instead of you and I condemning them, go, man, you think you're messed up? Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you what I've been through. Your vulnerability and my vulnerability are gonna reach people so much faster. That's what the incarnation is. By the way, I don't remember Jesus having picket signs and picketing non-Christians and telling them how bad they are. Anybody read that in the New Testament? But what I do know is the Bible says he's a friend to sinners. Jesus shows us that Yahweh is full of grace and truth. 
John 1.14, the word, this is the Greek word logos. It was used by ancient philosophers, but it means the intelligence. Jesus is the intelligence, the second person of the Trinity. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Let me get a little technical. This word right here in English and Greek is mano yinye. It means the only one of the same kind. There is no one else like Jesus. He is matchless. He is unprecedented. He is supreme. He is uncanny in his beauty to surprise us. His life and love are never ending. It is Jesus and he's full of grace and truth. You know what grace means, family? Grace means this, that he looks at me and he looks at you and goes, oh man, yup, you are a mess, but I'm going to get down in a mess with you. And the truth is, I'm going to pull you up out of it. I'm going to pull you up out of it. So if you think you're too messy for Jesus, you are just the perfect candidate. Now, you know what's frightening is the person that's really messy, but they don't know it. And you know who that person is? The religious. I'm a good person. Er, time out. Really? As soon as someone begins to give their resume of how God should approach them, you're the greatest mess of all because there's pride. Empty hands I bring simply to the cross, I cling. He's full of grace and he's full of truth. Jesus shows us that Yahweh is the light that shines into the darkness. Christmas is about shining into the darkness. And I wanna talk to you teenagers and you young uh, Gen Z's that are 25 and up. Let's, let's just do 30 all the way down to teens, teenagers and preteens. You're not the church of tomorrow. You're the church of now. Your life matters. When you look throughout the Bible, God has used young people in powerful and profound ways See, you think life is about acquiring stuff. Here's the danger about acquiring a house and a car and all that stuff is you got to pay for that and take care of it. And sometimes we begin to worship that more than Jesus and we lose the fire to do adventurous things for Jesus. We are a church to where we are not going to be in slavery to stuff. We're going to find freedom as servants of Christ, and God wants to shine the light. There are so many people who complain and complain and complain and won't do anything to make a difference. We are difference makers because of King Jesus. Check this out. John chapter 1. John, Jesus' best friend on earth, says this, all things were created through him, so he's creator, Yahweh. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. I love this little verse right here. I might get a little excited. You can join me if you want to. In him was Zoe. There's two words for life in the New Testament, bios, where we get biology, and zoe, where we get God's kind of life. Everybody's born with bios, but you have to be born again to have zoe. Please understand this. The gospel is good news that Jesus is Lord and he's king. My friends, not only does he forgive us, but let me ask you a question. What good does forgiveness do to a person in a coffin in a cemetery? You can go to a cemetery and say, you're forgiven, you're forgiven, you're forgiven, you're forgiven. They're dead. They can't hear it. The good news of King Jesus is when he forgives, he makes you alive. He shares his life with you. He brings you into his power. He brings you into his presence. What I'm trying to tell you this Christmas is you are not inadequate in him. You have more in you than you know. There is more in you than you know because he is unlimited. He is unlimited. Would you let him breathe through you? Would you let him live through you? Would you call on his name? Save your family. Save your friends. Be light in this world of darkness. He is a resurrected king. He's not asking for your talent or your ability. He's got plenty of it. He just said, are you available? Come as you are. Come bleeding and broken as you are. Come as you are. Come with your addictions. Come with your sin. He's big enough. He's strong enough. How do we know? Because that life was the light 
of men and women. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. During Advent, we light lights to show that the light of the world has come. And the light of the world has come to be light through you. Brothers and sisters, are you tired of being overcome by the darkness? Are you tired of the same habits that are destructive? Are you tired? Well, Jesus says, all those who are heavy laden and burdened, come unto me and I will give you rest. You see, in his light is life and love and it's rest. All of us are born void of life. But God, who is the light in life, says, I come to give you life. And the color of light in life is red. The color of light in life is red. That there's power in the blood of Jesus. Would you, would you come to the cross? Would you come to where there is love? Would you come to where there is life? You can come as you are. You can come as you are. He's got plenty of blood for all of us. It'll never run out. John 3.16 says this, for God so loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life happens the moment you say yes to Jesus. It's not talking about a destination, it's talking about a quality of life in relationship. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Brothers and sisters, it's time for you to come to the light. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we thank you that Jesus is the king of restoration. May we receive him. Would we be a people who say, Lord, fill me with your light and life. Restore me, King Jesus. Right now, I wanna take a moment, and I wanna pray for those of you watching online and those of you physically here saying, hey, pastor, I'm tired of the being overcome by the darkness. I'm ready to be overcome by the light of Christ. I'm ready to be forgiven of my sins and be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I'm ready to have new life, I'm ready. Brothers and sisters, today is your day in the silence of your heart, say this and enter his kingdom. His hand is extended to you, blood is dripping off of it, love is in his eyes, and he says, come to me, precious child. In the silence of your heart, just say this. King Jesus, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that on that bloody rugged cross, it should have been me I was the criminal, you were the innocent. But because of love, you took my place, you took my sentence. You were crucified, dead and buried. But on the third day you rose again, not only to redeem me from the power of sin and death, but to clean me, to make me pure, to make me righteous. Lord Jesus, I receive your Zoe life. I walk in a new freedom, and I belong to you. I was created by you and for you, and I walk in my destiny of grace. I pray this in Jesus' name, and God's people said amen, amen, and amen. Can we give God a round of applause? <clears throat> what I would briefly like to do before we do our soul tattoo and action step 
is if you prayed with me and you have a physical connection card, I want everybody to fill that out and say, I pray to receive Christ, okay? If you don't have a physical connection card and you prayed with me on the seat in front of you is a QR code. Get your smartphone, point it at the QR code and go to the connection page and put on there, I pray to receive Christ. If you have the TC app, you can go to the connection on the TC app and the connection card is there, I pray to receive Christ. If you're watching online, QR code's gonna come up on the TV screen. Grab your smartphone, open up the camera app, point it at it, I pray to receive Christ. We're gonna have a baptism on December 17th and it would be great to baptize you. Baptism is a symbol of saying I belong to Christ just like this wedding ring is a symbol that I belong to Vicki. So we'll take a couple moments to do that. Help us help you. Our family, our soul tattoo is pretty straightforward. Long for Jesus, the King of Restoration. This is what Advent is about. We're longing for him, the King of Restoration. And then our action step is this. As you guys know, several months ago, we talked about having four campuses in 10 years. Why? Because we want to reach people for Jesus. We want what's happening here to be multiplied because we want to advance the kingdom. And as we began to pray, God began to move and Transformation Church Lake Wiley opened up. It's in a fabulous location. We already have tons of people out there. Don't tell anybody, but I believe we're going to be at three services like really fast and God is going to use it powerfully to reach more people. Yes, we want to reach as many need people as possible for God so love the world okay so what we're gonna do at the end of the year we have our normal giving that we do a year-end gift is above and beyond our normal giving so to get our campus off debt-free it's gonna cost about 2.5 million dollars that's no problem for the Lord at all that is no problem how do I know we in this building yo we did this when we were four years old. Good thing we weren't smart enough to know a four-year-old church wasn't supposed to do that. So we do things we're not supposed to be able to do that seem impossible because Jesus is the impossible. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pray and we're going to believe. We're going to give our normal giving and we're going to give a gift above and beyond just to let you know some of the things that my wife and I are doing. We're going to give as much as we gave last year, maybe more. In the 90s, I used to buy trading cards. I have uh, like some, some Jordan cards that I'm going to depart with and some other cards, trading cards. And whatever we raise, it's going to this new campus. Why? because we're members of Transformation Church and we believe in the vision. We wanna see families healed. We wanna see teenagers move from suicide to life. We wanna see people who had no education become doctors and lawyers. We wanna see the homeless have homes. We wanna see the hungry have food. We believe that lost people matter to Jesus and that's what we're going to do. So those of you online, those of you here, we're gonna give sacrificially, we're gonna give generally, and for some of you, and I get it, go to our website, all of our financials are there. They've been there for 13 years. You can go look at it all. It's transparent, whoop, there it is. Will you pray with me? So by the end of the year, we're gonna raise the money, and we're gonna raise up TC Lake Wiley, and it's gonna be epic, and Jesus is gonna get all the glory. Lord Jesus, you get all the glory because you're good and you're epic. Matter of fact, we're going to give you endless praise because you deserve it. We pray this in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Pastor Paul here, and I want to thank you for joining us online today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus or you have questions about the service, we want to encourage you to scan the QR code on the device or screen in front of you, and we'll make sure to connect with you regarding your decision or question. Also, if you're ever in the Indian land, South Carolina or Charlotte area, we want to invite you to come join us in the house on Sundays. Finally, we want to close this service like we do all of our services, and that's with our benediction. Our benediction is a good word, and our good word is our vision. And together we say upward, inward, outward, transformers roll out. The reason we do that is upward, we love God completely, 
Inward, we love ourselves correctly, and outward, we love others compassionately. And I've invited some friends to join me today to come close our service, and the reason we do that is because this is just the oh. And now it's time to go play the Yay. All right, on the count of three, stand wherever you are today and join us in our benediction. One, two, three. Upward, inward, outward, transformers, roll out. Have a great day.